John chapter 3. So I want to just set the stage here. There is a story being told that goes way outside of any understanding of the law of Moses, the rabbis of the day, the Sanhedrin, which is what Nicodemus is. So this is a story in John 3 about Nicodemus, who is a, a, a very high in his position as a teacher, as a rabbi, as an authority figure. I mean, he's, he's up there. And, the, and I'm going to explain that here in a minute. But so he's coming to Jesus. He recognizes something special in Jesus. He knows that God is with Jesus because how could he, Jesus, perform the, the, the signs and wonders, the miracles that he did if God was not with him? So he sees something different. He's the only one. He's a Pharisee, and he's the only one that wants to meet one-on-one, -on -one, but not while people can see them. He's coming to Jesus at night secretly, meeting with Jesus and, and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation in which John is always so close to Jesus. John is the only one that records this. And so I just want to set the scene so that we understand there's a new, you know, there's a new law in the land, right? There's a new, we're, we're breaking outside of the laws of Moses now, and we're bringing in this spiritual concept of a new birth of being born again, of having a spiritual born again birth of the Holy Spirit. So in John 3, in the first eight verses, you're going to hear me say born eight times. So in the first eight verses, eight times the word born is used. And it's never of a physical birth. It's of a spiritual birth. So this is a spiritual this is the story that, that brings to us the understanding you must have to be born again of the Holy Spirit. And so that's really, um, it's, it's, it's a new concept to Nicodemus. He doesn't understand Holy Spirit. And here's what gets me. He should understand the concept of Holy Spirit to some degree because in the scrolls that he has available to him, there's Holy Spirit is mentioned three times, and those three times is in um, Psalm 51:11, "Cast me not away from Thy presence, and take not Thy Holy Spirit from me." And then you can find it again in Isaiah 63 twice in verse 10 and 11. I'll just re read verse 10. But they rebelled and grieved His Holy Spirit. Therefore He turned to be their enemy, and Himself fought against them. So that's kind of a little bit of a, you know, a, a puzzle. Okay, so Nicodemus is acting, truly acting, genuinely, you know, hearing this, this idea. Maybe he just doesn't understand Holy Spirit. I don't know that part. But I'm just saying I know that the word Holy Spirit is in the scrolls that he has. So Holy Spirit is mentioned seven times in the Bible. Three uh, verses in the Old Testament. I just read them to you. And, um, and then, of course, four in the New Testament. Uh, what they use more than Holy Spirit, obviously, is Holy Ghost. And that's mentioned in 89 verses. So a side note, in John 3, we see Nicodemus for the first time. He's never mentioned before. It, it, no other scriptures has Nicodemus um, up until we get to John 3. So we, we see him for the first time. Now, Nicodemus, he's a Jew. He has a Greek name. And when you, you take it apart, Nike, Nike, actually, Nico is Greek is Nike. And then Demas, it actually means um, Greek for victory of the people. So the guy, it, Jesus will call him in verse 10. He's a teacher of Israel which sets him apart. He's among the Sanhedrin, considered the most religious, most scholarly, most holy, set apart from all others. But they have lost their ability really to execute 30 years prior uh, than when Jesus was there, 30 years prior to Roman law. And that explains later why they have to turn Jesus over uh, to Roman hands to speak which is why Jesus was taken to Pilate, um, you know, for judgment, if you will. So they've lost, at one time the Sanhedrin had the ability to execute judgment and, and punishment, but now they've lost that. So 30 years prior to Jesus' being here talking to that, they've lost it. 
But <clears throat> what I want to, what I want to, you know, I, I like to set, I want us to go back. I want us to read the scripture from the day in which it was written. So we, we, we want to understand the context. We want to understand, you know, Jesus understands the day in which he's, he's speaking to the people. So he's speaking to them about about new ideas. He's radically different. He's, he's opposing everything that they know, their customs, their traditions, their authority. You know, he's the opposite of anything that they've ever known. You know, like all of their history. It's all been under the, the, the law of Moses. So we want to understand the setting in which Jesus understands he's talking to. So when we read John 3, we have a more intimate kind of, like we were there, you know, like we were hiding, as in the chosen show, John in the stairwell, right? I mean, like we were all hiding in the stairwell and we're hearing Jesus's radical teaching on something that has never been part of our history. None of our rabbi, it's never, it's never been this way. So that's what we need to understand is how, beautifully and humbly and meekly Jesus just up overturns everything he opposes all that which they are so if I go to the Jewish library I'll read straight from the Jewish library here on um, what the Sanhedrin is so Tanactic sources describe the Sanhedrin as religious assembly of 71 sages who who met in the chamber of hewn stones in the temple in Jerusalem the great Sanhedrin met daily during the daytime and did not meet on the Sabbath, festivals, or festival eves. It was the final authority on Jewish law, and any scholar who went against this decision was put to death as a rebellious elder. The Sanhedrin was led by a president called Nasi and a vice president called Av Din, father of the court. The other 69 san sages sat in a semicircle facing the leaders. It is unclear whether the leaders included the high priests. Okay, so that's a description of, of who Nicodemus is a, a Sanhedrin um, authority. He's, he's one of the scholars here. He's one of the sages. So now you understand how it's so important for him not to be seen with Jesus because well, Jesus was a rebel. And this guy, you know, none of the Pharisees, that's why Jesus is constantly calling out the Pharisees. So Nicodemus is a Pharisee, um, but he sees Jesus in a different light. The only one that does, as far as, the, you know, the authority is concerned. So Jesus in John 3 is bringing a new concept about being born again of the Holy Spirit, an idea that confuses Nicodemus. Let me just call him Nick. Um, and the Jews throughout. This is an act of rebellion. It goes against the laws of Moses. But Nick listens. All right, Nicodemus, he listens, which means he saw something in Jesus he knows can only be of God, like I said earlier. But he can only meet at night, for if he's seen with Jesus, he would lose his status, right, his respect, his status, his position of being a high and respected teacher, right, his upright kind of status figure in the Sanhedrin. So now let's read the story with that understanding of the day in which is being told, which is this new concept, the spiritual birthing of the Holy Spirit, that in the end, right, you remember the Jews rejected and crucified Jesus for it. But I believe in the end, Nicodemus loved Jesus and he may have secretly understood why else as an example, why else would he be the only one, along with Joseph of Arimathea, have taken such good care um, in asking for the body of Jesus off of the cross and preparing him for burial, burial, right? Nicodemus brings along, you know, a hundred pounds of spices to cover Jesus' body and the linens and all of that. So they took good care of him. Nicodemus was, I believe, loved him very much, or why else would he have done that? And why would John have recorded it? So this is where we're kind of getting the first concept as far as in, in the records of John of this Holy Spirit birthing. You know, the next time we will really, we'll really see that is when the Holy Spirit, which is, um, which is called the Holy Ghost in Acts 2-4, comes along 
in the upper room to everyone. All right, ready? John 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou does, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So I just want to stop there and say what he's saying here. Nicodemus is referring to a physical birth. And Jesus is saying, except a man be born of water. Okay, that's a physical birth. You know, when a, when a woman is about ready to have a baby, give birth. Her water breaks. So here Jesus is pointing out the difference between a physical birth, you know, coming through the womb, the, the woman's water breaks signifying, okay, it's here, it's time. Man be born of water and of the spirit. So he's saying, he's trying to, to, to let Nicodemus know, no, you have a physical birth that was, that was free will. You chose to have, by free will, to have a physical birth and come into this life. And it will be your free will that you will need to be born again of the spirit. You get to choose. You don't have to, but... To be born again and filled with the Holy Spirit is the only way you can enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, just because you physically came here, you were physically birthed, you have free will. You can choose not to enter into the kingdom of God. You can choose to go by your laws or your, your whatever, whatever it is. You get to make that choice, but you also have the free will that you would like to come in and live eternally with God. You would like to come into the kingdom of God, but that requires being, um, you know, baptized by the Holy Spirit. That requires inviting, choosing, if you will, the Holy Spirit into your life. And which side note, by the way, for since we're in the church of Laodicea and everybody's lukewarm, the Holy Spirit requires reading the Bible at least so many verses a day you can't the holy spirit will leave you if you're not in the verses now i know that most people don't have time to read the bible and a lot of people don't understand it they don't have the time to go to the jewish library and grab the context from the day um or the or, or get into the concordance and understand the real meaning of some of the words that we're, we're reading since i have that time i can make these videos so while you're driving to the grocery store you can listen to these videos and the Holy Spirit will be quenched. So that is why I do these videos. We've got to get the word out there in the most convenient way with today's technology is your little earbud in your ear choosing. Do you want to listen to White Hat, New Age material, or do you want the Bible word for word, King James, what it says? I'll finish that out. Uh, John 3, verse 5, he cannot enter. Well, let's start. Man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So I, I already explained that concept. You're going to be born of the flesh, you're going to be given free will, and you can choose the spirit. John 3, 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it list, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things? So Jesus is pointing out, look, Nicodemus, you are considered an authority. You are considered the most scholarly of all of Israel. You are a teacher of all of Israel. A master means teacher. And so he's saying, how, how can you, how, you know, 
Jesus is basically kind of scolding him right here. How can you not know this? All right, it's in Isaiah and it's in the Psalms that I already read. And not know as these things, John three eleven. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you of earthly things and you believe me not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Like they've already gone against Jesus' teachings. The Pharisees have already wanted to stone Jesus. And so that's what he says. Like, you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things. I'm down here, you know, teaching and preaching to the masses, you know, ongoing. And you don't believe the things I'm telling you of this earth, of the stories I'm telling you now. And, and you want to know heavenly things? You can't, can't possibly understand that. That's not in your comprehension. Honestly, people, none, none of us can comprehend heaven. We haven't been there. We can't comprehend it. It's going to be extraordinary, of course. We know that. But we can't comprehend that. That's not in our human understanding. Jesus came and taught us about what we need to do on this earth to get to the kingdom of God. To get to our glorified bodies, our eternal happiness, joy, and peace. Okay, he came here on earth to tell us this is what you need to do on earth in order to inherit the kingdom of God. John 3, 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, I'm not, I could break away and talk about, remind you about Moses and the serpent, but basically the um, Israelites were mumbling and gossiping and complaining about wandering around in the wilderness. And God got mad, bottom line, God got mad. So he sent a bunch of venomous serpents all around the Israelites and, and they bit them and many died. And finally, Israelites went to Moses and said, please pray to, pray to God, pray to God and ask him to stop with the venomous snakes. And instead of stopping with the venomous snakes, God tells Moses, look, fashion a bronze serpent, wrap it around the pole, and the people that are bit, if they look upon the serpent on the pole, they will, be, they will not die. It's basically a symbol of saying, these are your sins. It's a reminder. Look, you guys are sinning. So it's a reminder. This is the reason for that, um, you know, staff, if you will. It's to remind all of us, we're all sinners. And so that's what that's all about. What he, what's being mentioned here, which Nicodemus would have understood. Again, Jesus is speaking to people on their level. And that, and that is Nicodemus' understanding right there. That's the reason for that. Okay, John three fifteen. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God, so, the most famous line in all of the Bible, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's all you need to know. If you want to inherit the kingdom of heaven, you want to walk eternally with God, you want to be in your uncorruptible, glorified body, that right there is John 3, 16. That, you got to feed it. you got to nourish it. Okay, you've got to have the Holy Spirit in you, and it has to be nourished. It has to be fed. You can't, you can't, have the Holy Spirit, and then continue in whatever sinful ways. It doesn't work like that. You can't just say, I repent, and it's done. Well, you, you, you're changed. The Holy Spirit would change you because you don't want to sin. You, you're enjoying the friendship with the kingdom within you so much that why, why would you do anything other than read the Bible or study some other great books? Why would you? I, I know that a lot of people um, have to work and take care of family and take care of love. I get all that. That's why I'm making it super simple to get some verses in you every day. And until John, until all 21 books of John are done, 
Um, then I'll decide where I'm going to go from there. Probably Matthew, but I don't know yet. John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's how much he loves you. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That would be Jesus and not Christ consciousness, New Agers. John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's true. You can see the evil is ramping up minute by minute in today's world. John 3, 20. And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, and that they are wrought in God. After these things came, Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. That's John the Baptist, by the way. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth. And all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is, this my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. All he that is of the earth is earthly, speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from the heaven is above all. John's making a distinction between himself and Jesus. You see that? John 3.32, And what he hath seen and heard that he testify, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. John is pointing out, look, God and Jesus are the same. They're, they're one. There's no separation. Jesus is God. God is, God is Jesus in the flesh as the Son with the Holy Spirit that descended from heaven that John described earlier in John 1. Descended like the dove. So John is clearing up for these people that are confused. He's, 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 he's perfect at it. That's his job. That's, what he, that's his role. That's his purpose in life. To simply introduce Jesus as the Lamb of God. Isn't that cool? I wish that was me. For whom? I can't remember if I read this. I don't think I did. John 3.34 For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And all God's people said, the Amen.